welcome everybody to the Fifth Estate here at, well, we're not at the Wheeler Centre, at our special venue uh, for tonight because, of course, we have a very special guest. And, uh, of course, Malcolm Fraser is known to you all. He was the member for Wannan from December 1955 to May 1983, which um, by my calculations mean you've been out of Parliament just a year or two longer than you were in it. Yes, that'd be right. Is that about right? Mm, yes, Good. yes. Glad I got that right. He is the former Minister for the Army, former Minister for Defence and a former Minister for Education and Science. He is, of course, Australia's 22nd Prime Minister. Please give him another very warm Mila welcome. Before we start uh, talking about um, your new book, and Malcolm Fraser, of course, has a new book, Dangerous Allies. It's a star-spangled book, um, but I don't think they'll be playing the star-spangled anthem for you for it uh, very, very much. But before we get to that, um, I wanted to just ask you on your thoughts about current uh, dilemmas facing our Prime Minister of the moment, Tony Abbott, and his government. If we're to believe Tony Abbott's narrative, um, he has a little bit like you. He, he's coming to office having inherited a disastrous mess and economic crisis left to him from a bunch of lunatics. <laughs> and he's got to try and convince us that what he's trying to do is essential and important. How do you think he's doing? Well, uh, there's a great deal of press speculation. We don't know what's in the budget yet. Uh, a lot of things have been floated, the Commission of Audit and other things, which if they were all put into effect, well, I think they've all been floated to make us really frightened. And so maybe we heave a sigh of relief when the budget comes down and say, oh, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. On the other hand, they might do the lot. I, I just don't know. I can't make a judgment about all of that. But the, the, the problems come because revenue has fallen from about 26% of GNP to 23%. And Jeff Kennett made a good suggestion, I thought, the other day. He said, increase the GST, get rid of the exceptions. Margaret Thatcher increased VAT in England from 10 to 17 per cent in one go. And uh, if you were increasing it here uh, and got rid of the exceptions on food and things like that, you could do it in a way that compensated low-income people so that they didn't have an increase in the cost of living. And that would certainly raise the revenue to enable education and government services and health and all those things. And defence. Well, and defence, because we do get a free ride on defence. You know, one and a half percent of GNP on defence. Uh, America's up way over four percent, but they spend 40 percent of the world's total. Um, France and Britain, I think, are around about three percent each. Germany, probably about the same. But, um, you know, one and a half percent of GNP is really a laugh. We're not pulling our weight. And, I say that not in relation to uh, our great and powerful allies, but just for ourselves. What about the morality that you see in public life at the moment? What have you come to think about it after now 30 years out of Parliament? Well, it's not only politics. It's changed, certainly. Uh, I, I think people make a, a career, make up their minds very early in life that they want a career in politics. So they go to university, they do a degree, they go and work for a union, they go and work for a member of parliament, they go and work for a party organisation. And this could be true of Labour or Liberal, both. And people have never done anything in their own right as an individual to make their way, to be able to look after their family. They're dependent on politics. And if they're dependent on politics, um, they are, in a sense, dependent people. You, you, I think you want people in politics 
who, if necessary, can walk away from it on an issue, walk away from their party, say, no, I'm not going to follow that. People will exercise an independent judgment. And so far as um, the state of Victoria is concerned, the party began to give a message that they did not want such people when Ian McPhee lost his pre-selection. And I thought that was a very sad event. And a turning point, do you think? I think it was a turning point because it began to send a message. You know, the last pre-selection... I've used this example so often, but it remains the most valid. The last pre-selection to Higgins had really only one possible candidate. And then there was one other person, but for various reasons, not, not a real runner. And the possible candidate who stood was acceptable to the previous member, acceptable to the state president. I'm told that there were four people who wanted to stand but got talked out of it. I couldn't prove it, but I was told one was... It was suggested he could lose his job if he threw his hat in the ring. Now, if you went back quite a long while, 25 years, 30 years, but that's not all that long, um, the director of the party in Victoria would have said, what, only one candidate for Higgins? Blue ribbon seat in the centre of Melbourne? Not possible. We'll postpone the pre-selection and we're going to go around and find a dozen really good people so the electorate has a real choice. And out of that process, you would get somebody with an independent mind. It's fascinating because uh, the theme of your book is independence um, and the, the lack of it uh, that we have in Australia, that we've always had. Um, it's a radical book uh, for a former Prime Minister of Australia to write a book suggesting that we should sever um, the relationship as it stands with the United States, which is what you say, um, is, is, well, it is radical. Tell us um, about, well, tell us about this, this theme. Well, when I, when I really started to analyse our current relationship with America, I became more concerned, and especially concerned because of troops in Darwin, now, if America wants to use what will be a very powerful three-service task force to exercise power somewhere in the Western Pacific, they're not going to ring up whoever's Prime Minister of the day and say, look, uh, we want to go and clobber somebody. Um, do you mind? <laughs> they're going to do it. And our Prime Minister will maybe get a call late at night after it's done. Or he'll read it in the press uh, as he reads the newspapers at the lodge in the morning. Um, now, we are therefore complicit in what that task force does. And uh, more important than that, the purpose of Pine Gap has changed greatly. And this is all published material. I'm absolutely delighted that I've had no briefing on Pine Gap of any serious kind since I was probably defence minister. and I don't know how long that ago. That was, um, most of you probably weren't born when that happened. <laughs> but anyway, in the old days, it was an information-collecting operation. Now, changes in weapons technology, changes in communications technology, has turned it over the last 20 years into a much wider and in many ways more important and more deadly facility. How many people here would know or believe, you better believe it because it's true, that when two Australians were killed in Yemen, the basic information for that probably came from Pine Gap and within an hour they were dead. It's used in real-time killings for drone attacks. It's used for targeting other weapon systems. It's used also uh, with other facilities to help target anti-ballistic missile systems. So, you know, the Chinese are a bit like Israel. They've got a nuclear arsenal of 220 missiles. America has 7,000, uh, probably 2,000 on pretty high alert. And if the Chinese believe that America had an efficient anti-ballistic missile system that could knock out their 220 missiles over the Pacific or whatever before they got anywhere. 
then they would be rethinking their strategy, their strategic operations. And, you know, the nuclear balance, because it's, it's a very small deterrent by world standards. And uh, if Pine Gap, with these other capacities, uh, is being used as it is by the Americans, and then let's say provocative Japanese, because Japan is becoming militarist again, and people really had better believe it. And if something is provoked over those wretched rocks in the East China Sea, um, the Americans have said they'll support Japan. And if they say they support Japan, troops in Darwin, Pine Gap, are highly relevant. In these circumstances, if an Australian Prime Minister says, we don't like this one, it's got nothing to do with us. We have followed America into three disastrous wars. We're not going to follow them into a fourth. Who would believe the Australian Prime Minister? With the troops in Darwin being used and with Pine Gap being used. It's, it's, it's not believable. It's, um, it, it's extraordinary, too, that it, it's commanded by an American, uh, not an Australian. Uh, number two is an Australian. But... How many Which would be rather embarrassing if something did happen and, and they were called in. Well, you wouldn't know that they'd been called in. Nobody would make an announcement to that effect. But um, this might be an extreme example because um, governments haven't used Pine Gap at the moment or they haven't used drones to start knocking off senior military leaders. But if there was a stash between Japan, China, involving the United States in the East China Sea, and the Americans decided there was a particularly able general that they wanted to get rid of, and a drone was used, Australia's involved. America has a power to take us to war because it would not be believed that we are not involved because of the facilities that are now operating in or out of Australia. And, and that's, you know, do we want another country to have the power to take us to war? When we think about how Australia's got to this point, and in the book you give a very um, detailed history of our alliance with Britain, uh, with the US, um, you argue that it should have ended when the Cold War ended. Yeah. If we look at the period between the end of the Cold War and what you've just described at Pine Gap and Darwin, what's happened in those decades uh, that, that has allowed this unchecked? Well, since the end of the Cold War, instead of seizing the opportunity for strategic independence, which we should have, I supported the alliance during the Cold War because I really believed that the Soviet Union was an outward thrusting aggressive force. And there are a number of examples, including in our own region. The independence of Malaya was de delayed for 10 years because of a communist insurgency, which he we helped Malaya with the British and with the New Zealanders to overcome. And there were other examples also. So it wasn't just a European phenomenon. And uh, so I strongly supported the alliance then. But once that threat disappeared, what is the threat to Australia? It certainly wasn't Soviet communism. It no longer existed. And, and communism was about as disreputable as any philosophy you could think of. Um, but instead, with the idea of interoperability, closer involvement, being told we're a very special country with a very special relationship, uh, Are we right. a bit prone to flattery, do you think? Especially prone? Oh. A I, I, know, I, know, look, I, I had a conversation with John McEwen once, and I said I couldn't understand why some ministers would not accept British hospitality when they were going over to Britain. And he said, oh, he could. Because if you'd been to Chequers for a weekend and had a really tough negotiation on Monday morning, it's much harder to be really tough. <laughs> And I had a different view. I said, well, John, I would take the opposite view. If they thought a couple of nice days at Chequers and some good wine and good company 
was going to soften me up. <laughs> then I could jump them on Monday morning and be even tougher. <laughs> uh, but he said, well, a lot of people don't take that view. They would feel embarrassed to be tough after real hospitality. And that's why some Australian ministers, I think from both parties at times, would stand aside from British hospitality, which could be very flattering. You know, they don't make a 1930 Penfolds Grange. <laughs> well, that's a pity, isn't it? I thought you were going to give me one. <laughs> <laughs> to take us back to the, the end of the, the Cold War and the... Uh, I suppose I'm interested... In, in, well, you know, we're, we're going to check in and out of the, the political arguments that you're, mm. that you're giving for this, this thesis, but... There's also some relationship to the Australian culture, I think, more broadly, that allows government after government, both sides, to have a fawning, um, uncritical, at least publicly uncritical, relationship with an undisputed superpower. Um, what is it about us? And it, it, to me, it's something that's also connected I think somehow that we're still attached to monarchy, uh, that we, we have a great deal... Uh, there's a difficulty letting go with past ties. Is there something particularly Australian about this? I don't think so. Um, I suspect we haven't thought about it enough. And certainly in relation to empire, where the reliance lasted up to the... Second World War, and you look carefully at the words that Menzies used, um, there was argument about them afterwards. Did it mean we'd made a separate decision, or did it mean that Britain's, British decision bound us? His words were capable of either interpretation. Um, we really believed that the empire would defend us, and we hadn't realised that Britain had been so weakened, that, or if we had realised, we hadn't acted on it by the First World War and other events, that she no longer had a two-ocean navy. If we got into trouble, couldn't, would have had to send a whole navy to the Pacific, and that would have left Britain vulnerable. Well, obviously, British leaders had to protect Britain first. That was their responsibility. And uh, so the idea of dependence is deep in our psyche. And again, when we were small colonies before federation. Um, that was understandable. Few people, few resources in, in, in a military sense. And even after federation, I wonder how many people here think we became independent at federation. But the British still expected us to approach Britain through the colonial office. They still expected Australia, the newly federated Australia, to approach third countries through the colonial office and Deakin really got into trouble with Britain because he saw that the Americans were sending what they called the Great White Fleet on a world tour to let the world know that the American Navy had arrived. Now, this was not something that the British thought was of very kindly. Um, it was the British Navy that ruled the waves, not an American one. And when they found that Deakin had asked the Americans directly to have the Great White Fleet visit Sydney and Melbourne, uh, and I think this was uh, very early after the Federation, he got into awful trouble with Britain. You, you're not meant to do that. You're not a country. You're still a colony. <laughs> and we were treated like a colony. And the colonial uh, or the empire conferences, as they came to be called after about 1910, they were colonial conferences still after Federation. Um, were really all about trying to give what became the dominions a greater voice within the empire. But the hard truth of it is that in spite of South Africa, Canada, Australia, and Greenland was a dominion then, and Canada, often having differing views to Britain, it was always Britain that made the decisions in Britain's interest, and the conferences was designed to make colonials, Australians, feel they had an influence, but the British knew they were going to take the decision they wanted to take. And that's the way great powers behave. Mm. 
the, 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 the Americans first time, The first time this was ever taken on really would have been John Curtin in 1941. Was that the, with the, with, with the, without the fear of any pangs, we turn towards America? Was this the first, although, of course, in doing that, what he did was turned towards America. America um, but in part, it was a, an independent, it was a big independence. He risked, I mean, I'm sure he didn't sleep while he brought our, our, our sailors and army back on those boats, unprotected and vulnerable. I, I think there's no doubt that uh, for a very good man, a sensitive person, the worries and concerns of the war would have shortened John Curtin's life. And in that sense, he gave his life in service of Australia. Um, those troops coming back from the Middle East, the arguments he'd had with Churchill, Churchill even got Roosevelt weighed in on it. Mm to try and get the Americans to say, no, look, you've got to do what Churchill wants. And, uh, did, he, did he not uh, threaten to not defend Australia if he didn't bend? Did uh, he go that uh, far? You mean America or... Churchill. Churchill. I thought... I uh, thought but no, I, I, I haven't seen that. But, look, Churchill's priority had to be Britain. And he was right in that. You and can't you, say he was wrong. And your point in the book is that it's always as, going to be. It's Australia, always going all, to be... Yeah, but um, it just shows that the interests of Australia was quite different from the interests of a superpower, as Britain, I suppose, then was regarded. Uh, and that just because we cuddle up to a major power does not mean their interests are going to be our interests. Very often they will not be. You say that um, the result of our alliance now with America is a, is a, a new uh, paradox, that we need it to ensure our defence. This is what uh, the politicians tell us. Uh, yet we would most likely confront aggra aggression because of the alliance. How, how do you um, make an independent foreign policy from such tight, um, well, bases, uh, Pine Gap, uh, but also such a strong um, individual connection, it seems, with, with recent leaders? Well, you know, both parties support the alliance, and both parties support what's happened with it. I think our armed services also are duchess by American generals and admirals and whatever. Uh, as well as our politicians being duchess by American political leaders. And, uh, you know, the Labour Party, I think, learned to its cost that being anti-American or assumed to be anti-American in the late 40s or 50s was bad for votes. So they're just as enthusiastic. I mean, it was Julia Gillard who brought the troops into Darwin. Um, and uh, There was no debate about that, was there? There was no debate at all. No debate about the implications. Bob Carr, in his book, seems to indicate some reservation and uh, tried to get it played more low-key. But he doesn't talk about, well, if we are too close to America, how do we rebalance? I, I don't suggest... Uh, look, we're always going to have a lot of things in common with America. There, there's, there's no doubt about that, and all of that would continue. But to give them power to decide when we go to war or... I mean, I hope we never have to go to war again. But if we do, it should be a decision of the Australian government, of the Australian parliament, and not of a foreign power. And uh, it, it, the, the, Dane, the paradox that you mentioned uh, in quoting that sentence or two from, this, from, from the book comes because we are likely to be at risk because of the relationship with America, because America has embarked on three wars where we followed them. They've all been disasters, or one, if you like, is a disaster in waiting, but Western powers or Russia have tried to overcome, subdue, change Afghanistan, I think five or six times over 400 years or so. And Afghanistan's always emerged as Afghanistan quite different and not a democracy in America's image. Um, 
And we were misled, as you would see if any of you read the book, in relation to Vietnam. Misled by President Johnson, and that should not be surprising because Senator Fulbright, um, who put the Gulf of Tonkin resolution through the Senate, claimed later that he had been misled by President Johnson. If he's going to mislead one of his own senators, don't think he would have too many qualms about misleading a small ally in the southwestern Pacific. Um, you know, he, he had advised that the war was lost when Harold helped put three battalions. Harold was never told that. If he knew that, he would not have made that commitment. Uh, and the government of the day would not have made that commitment. And so following a major power into war, when they've already done it three times, we don't want to do it a fourth time. And if you look around at the world in which we live, and if you read or study the things that Hugh White has said, the most likely chance of a conflict is one between China and Japan. Japan's been very skillful, almost turning herself into the aggrieved party. But it wasn't China that committed atrocities in Japan during the last world war. And every Chinese school child is taught of what Japan did in China. You feel that much too much is made uh, uh, against uh, China, a fear of China. In fact, I think you even suggest that there should be gratitude expressed for China's role in seeing many uh, countries, particularly in our region, get through the global financial crisis? Well, um, China has managed her economy over the last 20, 25 years far better than America, far better than the European Union. And it's the stability and continued growth of her economy that has enabled Australia to go forward most countries in the Western Pacific to go forward uh, without suffering as Europe has and in many cases still is suffering. Uh, unemployment is still extraordinarily high in countries like Italy, Spain and Greece. Uh, a height which, uh, you know, I, I think is not sustainable really in a democracy over time. Um, and China has never been... Uh, I, I know you can argue about Tibet but so far as areas beyond traditional Chinese influence are concerned, China has not been an imperial power, as most of the European states have been imperial powers, as Japan and America have been imperial powers. And I don't believe China wants to become such a power. But, you know, the, America says that they have to build up their forces which Chinese call containment, and I believe is an attempt at containment as they contain the Soviet Union. A quite mistaken policy. Now, as tension rises between Japan and China, America and China, as a result of that policy, other countries in the region will start to get nervous. This tension isn't good for peace. It's not good for security. They don't want America to go away. China doesn't want America to go away because they know that would make countries like the Philippines nervous or others nervous, Vietnam nervous perhaps. Uh, and they don't want that. They want stability. Um, but it, it's uh, the most likely contest would be started, I believe, by an overconfident Japan, a Chinese response, America coming in on Japan's side. And then, you know, we're not talking about tomorrow. Hugh White said this might happen last year. To me, it's something that could happen over a 10-year period or a 15-year period. And so you'll go through a long period of uncertainty. But if it happens, and if the conflict cannot be contained to a very small, quick, sharp, something which then disappears, it would go on into a long, drawn-out war. America will never put a, an army on the mainland of Asia again. And they are planning and have published their planning for what they call uh, a, a, an air-sea warfare against China. Now, that, in my view, would go on for a long time. 
maybe as long as Afghanistan. But I also believe in the end, because of determination, because they are fighting for their own piece of dirt, the Chinese would win just as the Vietnamese won. America would retire to the Western Hemisphere. Are we going to retire to the Antarctic as a defeated ally of a defeated superpower? <laughs> that wouldn't be very comfortable. And being a defeated ally of a defeated superpower in this part of the world would really put Australia at risk. And we don't have to be. If we are independent, and assuming somebody has the good sense to repair the relationship with Indonesia, we can work with ASEAN and other countries of the region for a peaceful, prosperous, secure region where there aren't external threats, where we can all contribute to each other's safety, security and economic progress. You put forward um, suggestions about how this could be done. Some of them are pr practical, um, that the Darwin base should be shut down within 12 months, Pine Gap within five years to allow for the Americans to re regroup somewhere with some other willing, close buddy. Uh, the ANZUS Treaty is, is uh, another thing that you talk about in depth in the book. And that one of the things, and to me this is the most simple in a way, that what we need to do is invoke that treaty as it is to actually... Uh, you, you encourage people to have a look at it, and I did. I'd, I'd probably, like many of you, I'd never thought to read it. Um, and I didn't understand uh, what it was. And it is a treaty simply to consult. That's, That's right. Uh, and I, I wouldn't have thought that you had to sell your soul to honour that treaty. Well, it, it's a treaty consult, to consult, but a limited treaty to consult. If American forces or Australian forces or territory were attacked in the Pacific were attacked in the Pacific. And then, uh, you know, if that event happens, the two parties consult because New Zealand is no longer part of it. Um, and assistance, military assistance, may follow. But there's no certainty, mm. no necessity. I have absolutely no problem with the ANZUS Treaty as it is meant, as it is written, as it was agreed. No problem with that at all. But the wars in which we have followed America were never part, never covered under the ANZUS Treaty, quite outside it. The other arrangements, um, Pine Gap uh, and um, Darwin, are not necessary to the ANZUS Treaty. And, uh, you know, while I say Pine Gap, um, it would be fair enough to give somebody that, um, where we're changing the status, and was trying to reduce the sort of anger and aggro a bit, f four or five years to replace the facilities, it, you could say within 12 months every Australian will be pulled out of that facility. So it is very clearly seen to be what it is. And if you could get rid of the uh, troops from Darwin, which... I mean, they, they could go somewhere else without too much trouble and the aircraft can go somewhere else and whatever for the Americans. They'd have to rejig their plans. Um, and if you could get Australians out of Pine Gap, and this is not mentioned in the book, then when we were saying if there was a war somewhere in the Pacific, well, we're not part of it, we don't want to be part of it, our national interest is not uh, involved. Indeed, we can play a more constructive role by being independent because we can then, with Indonesia and ASEAN, which has been a remarkably successful grouping of Asian nations done by themselves without any Western help, and that might well be why it's been so successful, um, then uh, uh, we, we can help to, you know, get people to see common sense, to draw back from the edge. We really could have a, a more unique and influential role, is what you're arguing. We could have a role more like the role that uh, Norway or Denmark or even Canada play. Uh, 
because they didn't follow America to Vietnam or Iraq. And Pierre Trudeau used to speak, converse with Castro. I think he liked Castro, but I'm sure he also liked tweaking the American's tail also. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you about leadership in this. You, you um, mentioned that Paul Keating was the first Australian Prime Minister completely post-Cold War. And it's in your book, so I know it's true. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, and John Howard, of course, succeeded him. I've always been very curious that John Howard was in Washington on September the 11th, mm. 2001, uh, when the America was attacked and was clearly very personally shaken and affected. Um, he had a particularly close rapport with George W. Bush. Mm. How do these kind of things, where you are as the Prime Minister of the day, in a particular event with a particular friend or not so much a friend, how does that, how can that influence, would it have, do you think, influenced um, the, the policies and the, the, the um, decisions to it, come? It, it obviously had an influence in decisions to come. Um, it was, I'm sure, one of the reasons why we followed America into Iraq. Um, the close relationship between President Bush, the second Bush, and John Howard. Uh, and that's understandable. But if you're assessing your own country's self-interest, national interest, what is going to make this country more secure for the future? You can't really let emotion govern what you do. And this is where it can get hard. You've got to look at, you know, blunt reality. It was known out in the public domain that the idea of weapons and mass destruction in Iraq was a fabricated reason to go to war. We all know that now, but a lot of people knew it at the time. I mean, I had letters from people in London saying it's very uncomfortable to think that Saddam Hussein can have... Uh, weapons of mass destruction, chemical or biological weapons, over London in 45 minutes. Now, Tony Blair could have knocked that on the head immediately because he knew, we should have known, I knew, the Americans knew, that Saddam Hussein had missiles that could go 300 miles with enormous inaccuracy. <laughs> and if you looked at a map and, and put out uh, where they could go, they couldn't threaten any European city, much less London. <laughs> so the suggestion was a lie. And that was left there because it helped to justify the reason for going to war. And uh, Senator Carl Levin has done an examination of some of these things and made it perfectly plain that the administration was looking for a reason to go to war from the very beginning. From the very beginning, now, why? There were all sorts of theories to avenge the first President Bush, who happened, or whose senior advisers all happened to be against it, and all publicly said they were against it. But and someone you single out, George Bush Senior, as if, if, if his model of American power in the world, in fact, had been followed, uh, the world would be a much better place. Well, for the first, world, uh, first Iraq war, he had a coalition of 31 or two nations, every corner of the world. Even Jews, Israel was fighting alongside Arabs in that war. And he spoke of the kind of world in a way which everyone would want to hear an American leader speak because he was speaking of a collaborative leadership. He wasn't speaking of single power supremacy. Um, he was a person who understood the world, and I believe he was an underrated and one of the greatest American presidents, and I, I know I grieved greatly when uh, he got beaten and his, didn't have a second term. Um, 
you do really single... It's interesting who you single out in, in the book and George W. Bush does get uh, many mentions, although the only individual who gets a whole chapter is Doc Evatt, uh, which, um, you know, people... Some people laugh, of course, because they think of this mad doctor, um, uh, you know, who, who really went his own way on things. Uh, tell us why he is so special to, to, to get a single chapter in your well, book. Well, um, it's the shortest chapter, but he deserved it. Is it is very short, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> He's, he deserved the chapter. Um, he, he began our Department of Foreign Affairs effectively. There was a tiny department before then, but he was foreign minister uh, le leading up to the end of the war and, and uh, in the early post-war years. He was foreign minister in the formative stages of the United Nations. Um, he had an extraordinary role in helping to influence the way the United Nations developed. He foresaw with very real clarity some of the deficiencies in the present arrangements. Um, you know, he foresaw that many new nations were emerging. They had to be accommodated in a way which gave them adequate weight and adequate authority. He didn't want power of veto, did he, unless there was an, an emergency? Well, he, he would have argued against any power of veto, which would never have been acceptable to the major powers. But then he tried to get a limited power of veto. He tried to have it limited to... Um, or, or, or not effective if no great power interests were involved and if all the parties agreed to a, a proposition. Uh, but even then, the five original powers wanted the veto. But the real test of Everett in relation to this is, is not what Fraser says, but what the New York Times in an editorial said. And it really is worth reading because no other Australian in the history of this country has had such praise as a leader from a small country, unknown when the discussions began. They but said he leaves as the most brilliant and effective voice of the small powers. Of the small powers, pushing an argument as hard as he could, but never so far that he's made it difficult to reach a conclusion. And it was really very, very high praise. Um, and he deserves that. Now, later on, um, he became a bit erratic, perhaps. <laughs> Would probably send anybody mad, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Might well. Um, what would you have, um, with, with the hindsight, to, to see where our, our, um, the world is, how much the world has changed, in, in 30 years, um, and with the, the benefit of your experience, if you could go back in time to your prime ministership now and make some key changes to our foreign policy and to our relationship with other parts of the world, what might you have done differently? Remember the Cold War was on. Um, one thing I would have tried to do was to stop President Jimmy Carter announcing a boycott of the Olympic Games. Now, that has a story that attached to it that most people don't know. I was visiting uh, Helmut Schmidt, Chancellor of Germany, shortly after um, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And he was very angry with America. He'd had a long discussion with President Carter about the, what the West should do or should not do. I agree, he agreed and I agreed that the West should have a united approach to the problem. And he had argued with President Carter that there should not be a boycott of the Olympic Games. And President Carter agreed with him. Then, 24 hours later, he sees President Carter announcing a boycott of the Olympic Games. And, um, you know, he thought the lack of consultation by America um, was very difficult to live with. Um, he actually asked me to try and get that message through to the president. And I said, you can do it much more effectively for you, you're leader of a major state. He said, I've tried so much and so, for so long, Malcolm, if I do it again, I'll lose my temper. <laughs> that won't be any good. 
Um, but it was in the interest of solidarity that my government then decided we should try for a boycott also, and Helmut Schmidt did too. He succeeded in Germany. In Australia, it, it, it was a terribly divisive it's policy. It was messy, wasn't it? Mm. And it was messy and, and people were hurt and sports were divided. The whole Olympic movement became divided and it was really a very unhappy period. It was in the interests of solidarity. If I could have done one thing differently, it would have been to stop Jimmy Carter making that statement that there would be a boycott. Um, but if he made it, I would still have tried to support it mm -hmm. out of Western solidarity. But the main changes I would have made, not when I was Prime Minister, but if I'd been in the Parliament when the Soviet Union ended, I would have fiercely tried to establish an independent Australian policy. Uh, I would have wanted to keep an alliance with the United States. But I would not have wanted the circumstances in which, if they go to war in the Western Pacific, it de facto represents a declaration of war for and on behalf of Australia, just as much as the declaration of the British in relation to the First World War tied Australia to the most terrible slaughterhouse in the history of mankind. Would anybody like to ask a question? If you would, all you need to do is put your hand up and um, somebody will put... Oh, no, if you can go up to the stairs. Sorry, there are two uh, ushers. Just, yeah. yep, hop up there. And, uh, and there's another one up there. Anybody that would like to ask a question? Thank you. Um, oh. um, I should point out first that um, I actually follow you on Twitter under the guise of Doc Everett. <laughs> um, um, but my question relates to, you talked about Australia's inability to be independent in our defence and too heavily reliant on the US and previously on the empire. Suckling uh, empty teeth would be a good way to do it. Oh, it's the metaphor I'm using. But the question I want to ask is, as part of nation building that we could have done, say, with the Republic in 99, would that given us an opportunity to... Uh, I'm sorry, could you speak a little slower? I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm ancient and... Uh... <laughs> oh. You're ancient and I'm anxious. Um. <laughs> well, you can, you can stop being ancient. Um, you can stop being anxious. Uh, I, I'm, okay. I, I regret. I, I apologise. <laughs> I can't stop being ancient. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. So what I want to ask is, as part of nation building as Australia, when we had that opportunity in 1990 to become a republic, would that have allowed us to sort of become, jolt us out of that complacency to um, form our own defence, to would, be would more resolved Would that. it have helped our independence yeah. if we'd yeah. taken that? Um, I, I, I doubt it. Because the fact that we are still a monarchy um, doesn't really affect us in relation to that. Whether we'd been a uh, monarchy or a republic, unless many other things have changed, would have still left Britain with the power to take us to war in the days of empire, as she did. Um, we could have had more confidence in ourselves, but um, the model was a slightly difficult one. I think it could have worked, and I actually voted for it. But... You were a bit of a late-blooming Republican, weren't you? Oh, not all that late. <laughs> it, e an evolving Republican. <laughs> um, I would like to see the issue addressed again, but you've got to get some sort of um, oh, compromise between those who wanted an elected Governor-General, which would establish a separate power centre in the Governor-General, and the current constitution, where the power centre is in the Parliament, and you don't want competition between the two. I believe it would be possible to find a model, but there is nobody wanting to push it. They just say, well, this is a long-term objective, and some even say, well, maybe uh, with later events in the monarchy, we'll stay a monarchy forever. But uh, I don't think this is really relevant to our strategic independence as a nation. I really don't. This... Hi there. 
Can you hear me? Yes, great. Um, I'm just wondering about your views on the intelligence relationship that Australia has with the US, uh, essentially how that plays out with the defensive relationship because Australia relies so heavily on the US for its intelligence capacity and capability. Um, I don't and can't recall at the moment a single decision of my government that was altered because of so-called secret intelligence. The Office of National Intelligence once had one of its reports published in the Parliament and its reports were a collection of newspaper articles. <laughs> Hardly secret intelligence. Um, the, um, and it was the Prime Minister who published them, which he is perfectly entitled to do. There was nothing improper in that. Uh, people who operate in secret, in the dark, as most of you are because I can't see you, <laughs> uh, you can do things which you can't do if there's proper examination. And the exercise of intelligent capacity involves can you do it, but that's not a sufficient reason to do it. There's always a risk, a risk of being found out. And when the president of Indonesia's phone and his wife's phone were tapped, um, I mean, the president's a highly intelligent person. And he wasn't going to talk state secrets on his mobile phone. He would know how insecure all mobile phones are. Um, Put a memo out about that, don't they? <laughs> well, they could. But, you know, the chance of getting something of use to Australia's security was virtually nil. The chance of being found out was great, with significant damage to a very important relationship. And, uh, you know, in relation to Germany, Obama apologised to uh, Chancellor Merkel, said it won't happen again, said there'll be an inquiry. We could have done the same thing, end the matter. We've just said we don't discuss security matters, matters of national security. And I think Bill Shorten started to be critical of it. And somebody said, come on, Team Australia. So Bill fell into line. <laughs> now, you have got to preserve the capacity to question the wisdom of what's done in the name of intelligence. Um, and Australia, I don't think at the moment, has that capacity. Um, very childish, isn't it? Oh, if people are allowed to operate in the dark and given great powers and wonderful toys, you never know what they're going to get up to. <laughs> uh, Mr Fraser, have you had any uh, personal direct response from America to your book? And also, um, have you noticed any drones above the Mornington Peninsula since your book was published? Uh, there are some of those ultralight aircraft around. <laughs> um, they go overhead, but they've been doing that for quite a while. Um, the, um, I've had one response from a book. I sent a copy to a friend of mine. Uh, you won't have heard of him, Henry Kissinger. <laughs> um, and he might have mistaken my letter. He might have thought I wanted him to endorse it. Well, I knew, of course, that he could not endorse the book. <laughs> But he wrote a letter back and said he was interested in reading the book that I had made some very salient points. Now, salient means important, significant, relevant, needs to be taken into account. I even looked up what the Oxford Dictionary said. <laughs> because I thought it sounded good. I just wanted to know that it was good. But then he went on to say, but as a former Secretary of State, I would know he could not endorse it. Now, that's the only American response I've had up to this point, but I think he was the only American I sent a copy to at that point. I mean, how upset would they be, Malcolm, if all your dreams came true and we became a friend instead of this big alliance? Well, the best of Americans would accept it. Um, I, I've had 
when I was defense minister, I had fierce arguments with the Americans, especially over the F-111. And I very nearly took an action which would have led to the American Senate cutting off money for that aircraft, um, uh, which, which it could have done, but that's a long story and too long for tonight. Uh, I, I find that Ameri the best of Americans respect somebody who stands up for his own patch, so long as they've got a valid argument, a reason, and not acting capriciously or, or stupidly. But just as there's been a change here, the rise of American exceptionalism, which has really blossomed since America's been top of the greasy pole by herself, the only superpower. You know, we, we, we forget that when there were two superpowers, the United States restrained the Soviet Union in a real way in many circumstances. And the Soviet Union also restrained America. There were tensions and danger periods, but they both knew that ultimately there had to be restraint. But when there's only one superpower, that necessity is not so vital. And coupled with that, you've got the policies of the neoconservatives who've infected American foreign policy in serious, dramatic and disastrous ways. Um, you know, one of the things that upsets me is America says she's going to pay less attention to the Middle East and more to the Western Pacific. I'd prefer they went on paying attention to <laughs> the Middle East and none to the Western Pacific. Um, and is it possible to point to a single American success in the Middle East or in South Asia? We're going to have one more question because we just cannot end on that note. <laughs> um, my question was, given the increased technological nature of warfare, is it going to be possible for Australia going forward to, if we were to limit our relationship with the US, to still have access to the technology that would allow us to defend ourselves, given that we use their aeroplanes, their satellites, etc.? What is, how do you see that at the moment and how do you see that playing out going forward? Uh, we might even have to have some of our own satellites, but would that be a bad thing? Clearly, we won't get away with 1.5% on defence, probably nearer 3%, maybe doubling. But we're a better nation. I mean, we're, we're a wealthy nation. And what price is independence, reliance on ourselves worth? I think most of us would be prepared to pay, maybe quite considerably, to achieve that degree of pride and self-confidence in Australia as Australia. Now, there are a number of countries, Sweden, Germany, others, France, that produce good military equipment. But the Americans never really say no to a dollar, especially if they're going to make a lot of money over it. So while initially there may be a, uh, an overreaction to the sorts of things that I envisage, um, I think if we started to buy German equipment or Swedish submarines uh, or even perhaps Japanese submarines, they've got a very good submarine, I'm told, um, then um, the Americans say, well, look, these are dollars we're missing. So they would want the trade. And um, I, I, I think we... You know, New Zealand, when they said no to nuclear-powered and armed ships in their harbours, was never cut off from what's called the Five Hours Intelligence uh, Sharing Process. They always had access to that. Our time is up, and apologies if you didn't get to ask um, your question, but you can uh, buy a copy of Malcolm's book from up the back, and he's going to stay on stage uh, to do uh, some signings of it. The book is called... Dangerous allies, you just, you can't miss it, really, <laughs> all those stars. Uh, it is, it's a really important book and I hope uh, very much that the conversation about this relationship really uh, continues a bit more robustly uh, than, it, than it has been in the past because of the book. So thank you for writing it. I'm sure there's a lot of other things you could be doing. Um, and thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. Malcolm Fraser.